Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Quantum Spirituality on DreamVision7RadioNetwork.com, the show where past spiritual wisdom and present-day science merge to show us our future. Your host is Peter Canova, author of the 25-time award-winning book series, The First Souls Trilogy, available on Amazon and Peter's website, PeterCanova.com. That's P-E-T-E-R-C-A-N-O-V-A.com. This show is a live video, so if you're only listening and want to watch, go to Peter's website, PeterCanova.com. P-E-T-E-R-C-A-N-O-V-A dot com, where you can access his Facebook page to leave comments or questions. And click the D7RN link where you can receive a free gift video. Hi, everybody. I'm Peter Canova, and welcome to this episode of Quantum Spirituality, the show where our past wisdom and our present science meet to tell us a lot about our future. So I have kind of a unique show for you today. We're going to try and finish up something we didn't conclude in the last episode, which is our presentation about quantum physics and consciousness. But before we do that, I have a, I guess, a kind of surprise guest as she uh, agreed to come on at the last minute. And many of you probably know her because she has her own show about dreams on Dream Visions 7 Radio. She's Kathleen O'Keefe, Cat Cannabis. And she is a multi-award winning author and dream expert who's been seen on Dr. Oz, The Doctor Show, NBC, CBS. And she also wrote an Amazon best-selling book. Uh, it was a 2018 Nautilus Award winner called Dreams That Can Save Your Life with uh, Chief of Radiology from Duke University, Dr. Larry Burke. And Kathy's current project is a newly released, uh, first book of a newly released series with Reverend Patricia Caginello. Uh, of Sacred Publishing, and it's called Crappy to Happy, and it has also become uh, an Amazon number one bestseller, uh, actually on a pre-release basis, so it's doing really well before it's really hit the shelves. But anyway, Kathy, I want to welcome you to the show today. Well, thank you, Peter. It's such a joy to be here with you, and uh, thank you for that introduction. Yes, our book is is surprise, doing surprisingly well, and, and we don't even launch until next month, October yeah. 6th. Well, that, that's, that, that's great. I've, I've listened uh, to your show many times, and it's, uh, it, it, it's really very interesting, and the projects you're working on are really fantastic. I think they're helping a lot of people. But, you know, uh, I'm going to kind of get right into it because uh, we have a, I have a lot to cover in the show today. And, um, you know, I wanted to really talk to you about dreams uh, in relation to consciousness, because that's what this show is really about. Um, we study it from the angle of ancient spirituality, and we study consciousness from and the creation from the angle of quantum physics. But uh, you have a particular um, point of view, uh, really related to dreams. And I guess uh, my my kind of vision of the way things work uh, is like the movie Avatar, and that was a hit ser- hit movie by James Cameron and in that movie, human beings actually dream themselves into alien bodies and those were their avatars. And I kind of feel that's almost how our lives work. I feel that our souls kind of project themselves uh, into, in, into physical forms. I mean, you could say dream themselves or project themselves into physical forms, but that is really our true self. And that our subconscious minds, what we view as our human subconscious minds, are really, uh, let's say, the conscious mind of, uh, you know, contacting the conscious mind of, of, of our own soul so that we're in a dreaming state, for instance, and, you know, our subconscious minds or unconscious minds come to the fore because our conscious minds are kind of calmed down and at rest. What we're really doing is our subconscious mind is contacting its own self. It's contacting its conscious mind uh, in the soul realm. So this, mean, this means that dreams are really communications from our higher selves. Uh, what's your perspective on that? I agree with you, Peter. Um, you know, we, we do have a bit of the avatar in our, in our dreaming world because our bodies live, you know, for a limited amount of time and have limitations, like an avatar, they have limitations during our waking world. Um, and, and our soul consciousness actually jumps from body to body as we reincarnate and take on new life forms. But while we're sleeping, we've got a little bit of, of you know, conscious and, 
and subconscious kind of joining together to enter another world called the dream world. So it's a little bit of like a, a little microcosm of our, our consciousness jumping from lifetime to lifetime. It's jumping from the waking world into the dreaming world where we do live another life. And during that life that we're living in our dream world, we're actually solving problems like an avatar. That movie was all about going into this other world through sleep and solving problems. And that's what we do. We have dream work and we solve problems in our dreaming world. Um, and we often use information from previous lifetimes. So in your view, consciousness is really a thread that transcends obviously just our physical selves. It's a, it's a consciousness is a thread that goes up well through who knows how many <laughs> layers of existence or, or, or whatever. And that, uh, you know, this uh, information stream is sort of coming downward to inform us. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. I would. Um, when we're in this way in our waking world, we kind of forget. It's sort of like with, with Avatar, when they wake up, they, they know they had a dream, they remember the dream, but they're not actually in that dream anymore. When we wake up, we're no longer in our dream. But when we're in that dream world and we're not held back, by our physical bodies, we can revisit other worlds, we can revisit past lifetimes, we can revisit past friends that we may actually have in this world. There could be people in this world, in our waking world, that were also our friends in a previous world, much like what we saw in Avatar. And then, you know, it all kind of ties together. So our, that's one of the reasons why our dreams are so important in our waking world. Mm. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's really kind of a phenomenon that at least down here at this physical re level of physical reality, we experience fragmentation of consciousness. Okay. So for instance, you know, we have our conscious mind that deals with all our everyday doings in the world. And then we have the subconscious or unconscious mind. I believe there's a relationship between those two, uh, which is at a, a lower level that we either have to attain through meditation or through sleep where our brain waves slow down. And then we have, we seem to have a, a an overriding super consciousness that connects all of us. Um, and, uh, you know, I, in, in my view, that fragmentation happens because um, if it wasn't, we wouldn't experience physical reality. I mean, if we were in the super conscious all the time, we probably wouldn't be down here. We'd be in another, another entire dimension with the wholeness. But so what, what, what is your take on, you know, uh, conscious, subconscious and super conscious and their relationship and how they work? You know, um, I believe it's much like Dr. Sigmund Freud's id, ego and super ego, but a bit more. There's more to it than that simplicity. We're made up of our inner parents, our inner children, and our individual personality, which you kind of saw in Avatar, going between the waking person and their Avatar person. They contained their personality. They took that with them. And these aspects of self are part of our decision-making you know, process, like the ego or the individual personality actually mediates between our id, which is our child, and our super ego, which is like our parent within. And so the id is always trying to get us to do things like eat cake instead of our dinner, or eat, you know, dessert first because there might not be room for it later. And the super ego is trying to get us to make good decisions and be an upstanding person, a person. And then the id, our true personality, is the one that's kind of sandwiched between the two and is mediating between those. And we saw that in Avatar as well. So to a degree, they're fighting with each other and, and everything, but then our personality or us, which we carry from lifetime to lifetime and from our waking world into our dreaming world is, is kind of caught in the middle. So, you know, um, we're influenced by how our parents raised us. Um, and our environment, the environment we're living in, are we in a war zone? Are we in a beautiful paradise? All of that. And then there's our personality, which again, with Avatar, we saw the personalities as avatars were also the same personalities 
as, as the person who was not the avatar. So a degree we're a product of our environment, that existentialism or experiences that we take with us from one life to another, from our waking world into our dreaming world, and our individualism, our personality that is eternal that we take with us to every single world and every single life. And these all play into the super conscious mind, which is the place of endless possibilities. Again, as we saw in Avatar, there are no, um, there are no limitations with the super conscious mind. If it can think it, it can do it. Even when it comes to flying, you know, now we get on jets. Yeah, we don't flap our own arms, but we get on jets. The superconscious mind takes everything, not only from our experiences in our lifetime, but through universal oneness, connecting into that, all of that experience as well. It's basically our, our collective, um, collective mind, our collective, mm -hmm. uh, well, it, from its standpoint, collective consciousness, but from our standpoint, perhaps collective unconsciousness. So, you know, a lot of people look at accomplished speakers like yourselves and they kind of see you as a finished product Wow, they really got it together and so forth um but can you just tell us what were the experiential aspects of your life or your being that got you to the point where you were a person who was even able to connect with your dreams uh understand them, interpret them, and use them to your benefit. I mean, something like that, you know, I, I, I suspect it doesn't happen overnight. I suspect there's different ways people can arrive at that. But what was your own personal experience that enabled you to be what you are today in terms of dreams and how you use them? Well, I believe that when we're born, we're born with gifts. Um, you know, we, we, we don't just come into this world um, without some gifts that we bring with us from previous lifetimes. Um, and so I think that my gifts were gifts I'd had before. Um, my grandparents were Carney Royals. They were the Flying De Leons in the Barnum and Bailey Circus. And when they really? were swinging from the trapeze as trapeze okay. artists, they were actually spiritualists who spoke with the dead, saw the future. And um, this may be in my DNA. This may be in part of my, my you know, universal oneness uh, family unit that I brought with me. And this gave me the ability to have precognitive dreams that I had, such as the ones that saved my life from breast cancer three times, when I had these monks, Franciscan monks, walk into my dreams and tell me I had breast cancer when the, you know, the, the doctors and the tests on which they relied missed it all three times. So, you know, that's connecting into that universal oneness again um, and uh, trusting in your gifts, your innate gifts. But don't you feel, uh, don't you feel that, uh, that um, people, uh, let's say people who aren't born with that in their, in their system or inherited that from grandparents and so forth can, by other means, work their way into those states? Oh, absolutely. I think that we all <clears throat> are born with the innate gift to dream. Everything dreams. Babies dream. Even fetuses still in the womb dream. They've got rapid eye movement, REM. Um, puppies, kittens, baby birds, everything dreams. And if it weren't something that was so incredibly important, we wouldn't be doing it for almost half of our life. And um, let me ask you, I'm curious about this. What differences do you see between dreaming and meditation? Well, they're similar, but they're different. It's like, what's the difference between a car and a bus? Um, you know, in meditation, you're fully aware. You're sitting up, you go into another level but you're aware in dreams, unless they're lucid dreams, you're not aware that you're dreaming. Your dream, like an avatar, becomes your total reality. And so that, that's what I see is the main difference. With meditation, you may go to another realm, make another connection and come back. Now, there are some uh, sleeping meditators um who, edgar like, casey edgar casey right who would go to this other realm and not even know that they had been there when they came back it's like forgetting your dream but for the most part i think most people that meditate 
um, you know, it, it's more like a waking world uh, experience versus a sleeping world experience. They're okay. similar but different. Now, um, finally, uh, because we're, um, we got a lot uh, to do in this show, so this is the last question I'm going to ask you, but do you have any tips to help people become uh, dream aware or tap into their own higher selves, their own higher consciousness? Absolutely. What advice can you give people? I, I would advise you to keep a dream journal. Like I said, everything dreams, babies, kittens, puppies, birds. Learn your dream language because it's how our inner selves actually speak to us, how our, our deceased loved ones speak to us with our individual dream language. And it's based on signs and symbols to a large degree. Somebody has a snake in their dream and they think that's a nightmare where somebody else sees the snake as the Kundalini and thinks they've had an enlightened dream. That's where your dream language comes in. And it's so important. We actually hold our Akashic records uh, in ourselves through universal oneness. And we can tap into those through our dreams. And when we do that, we're tapping into our higher consciousness um, and the results will be amazing. So keep a dream journal, write down your dreams, learn your dream language, and you'll be amazed at how your life will change for the better. Yeah, well, the language of dreams is certainly comes, uh, comes to us through symbols. And uh, in fact, that's what myth is all about. Myth essentially is an articulated uh, dream language uh, that comes and tells us truths in symbolic forms. So um, Kat, you know, I really want to thank you for coming on to the show. It was really interesting. We'll uh, try and have you um, uh, back again. And uh, I really appreciate you telling us uh, a little bit about your view and dreams. So folks, dreams, uh, another door, I guess we could say, to contacting a higher consciousness, one of uh, several doors that people can take. Thank you very much, Kat. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, now, in the upcoming segment, next segment of my show, uh, I want to continue where we had left off the last time because there is so much material. And the last time we were talking about uh, quantum physics and uh, its relation to consciousness and there was so much information, I really couldn't get through the entire visual presentation. So we're going to uh, pick that up again. And uh, I, I also want to tell you, and this is very important, just to remind you that the first three um, shows of a quantum spirituality are really uh, very closely interconnected because they were the shows where I'm doing a, an audio visual presentation to kind of ground people in the principles of consciousness and how it works, both from the standpoint of ancient spiritual wisdom and from the standpoint of quantum physics, and then show how the two intersect and what they're really trying to tell us about the creation and the consciousness and so forth. So um, I really want to encourage all of you uh, to go back and look at the archives so that you can see this as kind of a unified presentation because there's only so much that I can cover uh, in one show episode. And there's a lot of uh, really rich um, uh, material in there. So um, please uh, go to the archives, which are available on my website, petercanova.com, and you'll see a section there for Dream Vision 7 Radio, where it has a uh, link to uh, my archive page. And uh, please take the opportunity to go back and look at those previous shows. The Fast Souls Trilogy, one of the most highly awarded fictional independent book series on the market, is a grand vision of human evolution. It chronicles the first spirit consciousness to enter the material world in three page-turning novels that introduce a new paradigm of reality based on genuine ancient wisdom and quantum science. These inspirational thrillers will force you to rethink the nature of the world in which we live. Visit the PeterCanova.com website for information and ordering. In a world facing annihilation, a miraculous African nun rises to become the first female pope through a web of war, murder, and betrayal. 
Loved by some, hated by many, she becomes the deadly target of Islamic terrorists and her own cardinals as she introduces a new vision that will either save humanity or accelerate its destruction. Four people must race against a nuclear holocaust to learn her astonishing secret. Pope Annalisa is available at PeterCanova.com, Amazon, and other online booksellers and bookstores worldwide. Why are we here? How can we be happy? Questions asked from millennials to boomers. Crappy to happy. Sacred stories of transformational joy answers them using true stories of grit, grace, and love. James Redfield, author of The Celestine Prophecy, wrote in the foreword, This book is a seminar about emerging truths and offers grounded solutions through the art of the comeback. Dr. Bernie Siegel, a contributing author, wrote, Bodies die, but spirits and consciousness survive and recycle. So grab some tissues, open your book, and prepare to cry and laugh till it heals. Crappy to Happy by Reverend Ariel Patricia and Kathleen O'Keefe Cannabis. Available from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and booksellers worldwide. How did life start on Earth, and why is there so much suffering? Are we living in a simulated reality like the characters in the Matrix movie? Do parallel dimensions exist alongside ours, influencing our experience? What are the mysterious dark energies that penetrate our universe? Peter Canova folds space and time to bring the twin bookends of ancient wisdom and quantum science into a single focal point, answering these and many other deep mysteries of the creation. Quantum Spirituality can be heard every Tuesday at 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. Eastern and 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Pacific on syndicated Dream Vision 7 radio network. See the show where past and present merge to show us our future. This is Dream Vision 7 Radio Network, uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart, bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax, and enjoy. Let life flow. Welcome back to Quantum Spirituality on Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. I'm your host, Peter Canova. And uh, if you uh, enjoy this show, I would really encourage you to go to my website, petercanova.com. That's P-E-T-E-R-C-A-N-O-V-A.com, where you can access the archives for this show. And I have other interesting articles and videos for you to look at. Now, uh, we're going to pick up where we left off uh, at the last episode, and we were talking about quantum physics and what quantum physics is telling us about the creation, about ourselves, about our consciousness, and what life might all be about. In the first segment of the first show, we covered the same questions through the eyes of ancient spiritual texts, specifically ancient mystical Gnostic texts. And amazingly enough, the Gnostics pretty much jumped the gun on quantum physics and covered just about everything that quantum physics is saying now. But um, I have a little special surprise for you at the end of the show that I'll tell you about that will tie all that together. But as we left off the last time, we identified two paradoxes. And the first paradox is that the quantum world makes up the visible world that we see, and yet they have nothing similar. The, the quantum world operates entirely different from the visible world. And to give you an example, in the visible world, we seem to live in a world of solid matter and particles. But in the quantum world, it's really light energy waves that uh, precede that. There are no particles really at the quantum level in terms of being fundamental. The, what, what is fundamental is waves of light energy as opposed to particles and solid masses. In the visible world, space is limited to one object. I obviously can't stand in the exact same space that you're standing in, but in the quantum world, objects can exist in the same space. In the visible world, time is linear, but in the quantum world, there really is no linear time. It's non-existent. 
In the visible world, we operate with speed of light limitations, but in the quantum world, there is no light speed limitation. And finally, we perceive things happening in the visible world locally. That is, they're events that are confined to a particular, uh, a particular space. But um, in the quantum world, we experience what's called non-locality. So for instance, uh, if you take two electrons, for instance, and they might be the equivalent of light years apart, um, you can do something that, um, let's say you stick an arrow in one electron and it says, ouch, uh, the electron uh, millions of light years away is going to say, ouch, at the same time. In other words, there's an instantaneous communication, an instantaneous connection between them, which is something that we don't normally experience in the visible world. So this is really one of the major paradoxes that science is trying to figure out, which is how the microcosmic world, which, which makes up what we are, can be so different from the macrocosmic world, which is what we experience. Now, the second paradox that we talked about had to do directly with consciousness itself. And that is how does organic consciousness arise from inorganic matter? And how is it that energy, at least according to materialistic science, doesn't play any role in the appearance of consciousness? The materialist scientific viewpoint basically says that matter came first and somehow ended up with consciousness, which is not anything they've been able to explain either theoretically or experimentally. So it's a supposition, but it's a supposition that uh, probably the majority of scientists live and die by, uh, as opposed to understanding that consciousness preceded matter, that consciousness came first, and that everything that arose thereafter, including ourselves, including the material world, is actually a product of conscious energy. Now, we saw last episode how there started to be cracks in this scientific materialist view of the creation. And those cracks were primarily due to the fact that experimentally in laboratories, there are a number of experiments that we cited. And again, I encourage you to go back to our previous show, but we cited a number of key experiments that seem to indicate that, wait a minute, consciousness uh, actually has very much to do with the controlling matter that we may actually collapse energy waves. Our consciousness may actually collapse waves of energy into point particles and into the matter that we know. So it was demonstrated in many of these experiments that there is a direct correlation between consciousness and the control and the manipulation and the appearance of matter. And as a result, scientists started to look at things in a different way and formulate different theories and do different experiments that seem to indicate that our universe and our lives are really like a holographic projection of a consciousness from a source that we can't see. Now, this whole idea of a holographic universe or a universe that operates like a hologram uh, was validated or seemed to be validated by some very recent developments relating to, of all things, black holes. Um, you know, a black hole, I mean, I'm sure everybody is aware of what a black hole is, but essentially it's, it's an area where uh, no light can escape. And it's, it's just what it says. It's a black hole. Anything that goes in there isn't going to come out on, on this side again. But when scientists were studying the black holes, what they found was that the information that makes up a black hole, I mean, everything that describes what a black hole is, what it contains, what it's made of, what, how it operates, that is called information that you would think that the information that describes a black hole would be in the volume or inside the black hole as we see here kind of the center of the hole. But it turns out surprisingly that that's not the case. The information that makes up the black hole, that makes up the reality of the black hole is actually on the surface area of the black hole, what they call the event horizon. It's on the outside. So if we can take an example that likens this to our own universe, here you see a bucket, and let's say that bucket is our universe. Everything inside that bucket is our universe. Now, you would think, again, like with the black hole, 
that everything inside that bucket, and here we see the earth, a little globe of the earth in there inside the volume of the bucket. Well, you would think that the comings and goings and all the things that we experience here on earth, which are part of the universe, would be contained within the universe. That doesn't seem to be the case. The case seems to be that the information that makes up our universe is on the outside of the universe, kind of like if the universe was papered over and uh, that, uh, that paper forming the boundary is where that two-dimensional surface is where all the information resides and it's projected inward to give the appearance of a three-dimensional universe and a three-dimensional world. Pretty weird, but that seems to be the indications of how the universe and how everything seems to be operating in a holographic way, like we're holographic projections of what we think to be ourselves. Now, we, we were able to simulate um, in, in technological terms this whole um, holographic process a few years back, and this is a picture of um, the CNN newsroom, and the woman in the center is Jessica Yellen, and she's in Chicago. The person on the left is Wolf Blitzer, and he's in the New York office. They holographically projected the image of Jessica Yellen into the New York newsroom, and the two of them held a real-time conversation. And if you had seen that, if you had seen videos of it, you would not have been able to tell that she was not there. So how were we able to do something so remarkable as this? Well, remember, I think we said in some of the previous segments that nothing that we do is really anything that we create because the templates for all these things are already out there. It's already out there in the kind of universal conscious wave. And essentially what we're doing is we're remembering or we're imitating these processes and we're translating them into, into you know, physical technology. So in, in an essence, you can say imagination doesn't really create. Imagination remembers things that are already there. Now, how does all this work? Well, one of the things both in ancient texts and in quantum physics that's very highly accepted is the existence of parallel universes. Now, they envision that the universe that we are in uh, is sort of the end product of any number of other universes, but they're starting to realize that energy and information from those other universes may be progressing on through these layers of the onion in effect and coming into our world. So our world is not necessarily, or our universe is not necessarily limited to the types of energies and matter and things that we experience here, but maybe the product of energy and matter that we don't see. We have these parallel universes and invisible energies that are really seeming to affect the reality that we experience in three-dimensional material terms. So, um, it seems that consciousness uses varying degrees of matter and energy to project itself through different dimensions. And as it goes through those different dimensions, it manifests itself in different degrees and levels of energy and matter. And don't think of matter just as the gross matter that we experience here, the stuff that we can knock on and see and so forth. There are many forms of matter and scientists have already identified dark matter, which is matter that absolutely affects what's in our universe. In fact, it's probably what holds our universe together and prevents everything from flying apart. That dark matter occupies space, but we can't see it because it doesn't interact with normal light. There's also dark energy, which falls into the same category. So science has pretty clearly identified, and most, I think, scientists really uh, would support this statement, that dark matter and dark energy uh, permeate our universe. And um, I think what many of them are starting to realize is that that energy and that matter could be products bleeding through or filtering through from other dimensions. So uh, we have a statement by uh, Bernard Haish in 2006, a theoretical uh, physicist that suggested that consciousness is produced and transmitted through, transmitted through the quantum vacuum or empty space. The thing about it is that we know there's no true thing as a vacuum. What we perceive as empty space is full of invisible matter and invisible energies. Now let's, um, 
let's try and get down to the nitty gritty of how this really operates here. So, cause I, I, you know, I, I really like you folks to understand the nuts and bolts of how things operate. Okay. Cause we can sort of, um, visualize and imagine and meditate and so forth and so on. But I, and all that's great, but I think it can be enhanced by really having a clear theoretical framework of how these energies and how these, um, elements of consciousness can manifest itself to present us the world that we experience. So if we take uh, a diagram of a typical uh, electric power grid, um, we see right here uh, the generating station where the raw power comes from. And then there's the step up transformer, uh, which basically uh, puts the energy in a state where it can be transmitted. Then we have the transmission lines here that actually send that, uh, that energy uh, or electricity out. And then it comes down to another transformer and the step down transformer basically um, ratchets down the energy ratchets down the voltage so it can be used for different purposes. In this case, we see for domestic purposes, uh, for industrial purposes, and for other purposes here. So each of these will operate by a different frequency, uh, a, different, uh, a different voltage in order to be able to perform its functions. Now, let's take the, um, the same diagram and put it into uh, more cosmic terms more spiritual terms, more energetic terms, more quantum terms. So we have the generating station, which would be the source consciousness. This is the universal or underlying consciousness that really is the basis for all creation. Now that consciousness manifests itself and prepares itself to be transmitted through different energy sources, which the ancients would identify as different spiritual beings. They would call them eons or angels, whatever. But these are different centers of energy that have the function of basically dividing up and the responsibilities or the energies of, of consciousness and transmitting them off to, we see right here, this is the information system. The information system, the transmission lines are these different levels of parallel universes through which the energy passes and with each universe or with each parallel dimension it passes through, the energies are modified in different ways. Finally, uh, they come down to uh, the area of the physical universe and the analogy to the step-down transformer happens through the human brain. The human brain is a limitation on consciousness. Um, and the previous show, we talked about Dr. Abin Alexander, who had one of the most startling experiences with consciousness and other dimensions while his brain was shut down from meningitis. And his first perception when he pulled out of it was that the brain is not the source of consciousness. The brain is actually the limiter of consciousness. And the purpose of that limitation would be for us to experience and operate a, in, in a physical world. So the, you see that the, uh, the energy, the, the, the conscious energy, uh, essentially is uh, stepped down and it's transformed. And uh, it, it, it permeates everything in our world. Um, so in one sense, it manifests as lower cellular consciousness. In another sense, it can manifest as animal consciousness, which is a higher degree of consciousness. And then the peak uh, performance of this consciousness resides in the human being where we are uh, experiencing self-aware, self-reflective type of consciousness. So it operates just like an electrical power system. In fact, the electrical power system is probably modeled after, again, one of these processes that exists out there at a higher level that we're simply translating into technological terms and we have our power grid here. So this is the consciousness power grid and how it operates. Now, this idea, these experiments, and the whole idea that consciousness is um, really the fundamental property of the universe is really turning scientific materialism on its head. The whole idea that matter was there, but then somehow matter developed a human brain and the human brain is where consciousness is and consciousness is nothing more than the firing of nerve synopsis, synopses, you know, within our brains. And that's their limiting view of consciousness. It's not held water. And uh, scientists are increasingly are turning 
to a different view of the universe. So we have some quotes here from different scientists around the globe. Um, John Wheeler, very, very influential and famous um, uh, physicist, said that the entire universe collapsed into the state we see specifically because there had to be conscious observers present to cause the collapse. Any possible universes that do not contain conscious observers is automatically ruled out. Eric Verlinda, another uh, respected physicist, said space and time are not fundamental but emergent. The universe we see playing out in space and time may be just the surface level where we float like little boats while leviathans stir in the deep. Well, what does that mean? Who are the Leviathans stirring in the deep? Well, we, you know, as we discussed with Kat uh, in the uh, previous segment, uh, those Leviathans very well may be our souls projecting ourselves into a physical experience. What we experience as reality is in fact fabricated in a computer. Uh, Nick Bostrom and Elon Musk, the, uh, the, the, the man behind uh, Tesla. Well, Musk actually is kind of interesting because he actually takes almost the, uh, the movie Matrix point of view that there is um, maybe another race out there, an alien race or a race of computer machines that are fabricating our reality and we're kind of stuck in it. Um, I'm not sure I buy that, but I mean, the point is that there are all kinds of uh, views about um, this holographic projection or simulated projection of reality. Uh, they all agree that um, what we experience as reality is not the true reality, but what's behind that, um, I, I tend to look at more of um, consciousness rather than machines. Anyway, finally, um, Donald Hoffman has said, our perceptions don't contain the slightest approximation of reality. Rather, they evolve to feed us a collective delusion. The particles of physics have no objective observer independent features. Okay, so you're really seeing how this is a radical departure from the, the very narrow view of traditional materialist science, that everything is matter and only matter can explain life, only matter can explain consciousness, and only matter can explain the creation. Um, it's pretty much proven not to be true, so they're left with a void and they don't really want to tackle the whole problem of how something like consciousness can be the basis of reality, and yet, you see all the quotes here, they've really been forced into that corner where they're having to have to deal with a very different view of how creation and how the world operate. Now this has led to um, a movement called panpsychism. And panpsychism tells us that consciousness is fundamental. It didn't emerge at some point during evolution or it's not the product of evolution, um, rather the other way around. Uh, it could have uh, it could have caused evolution, um, and uh, I think that uh, we want to uh, take a break shortly. But let me just finish up on this slide and say that um, consciousness, if consciousness is everything, it's very clear that it has different levels. Some things are barely conscious, like a rock with low energy vibration. Other things are highly conscious, like human consciousness with a high energy vibration. And when we come back from uh, our next uh, segment, we're going to delve more into this whole idea of how that operates. Um, I'm Peter Canova. Uh, this is Quantum Spirituality. Uh, we're going to take a break right now. We'll be back shortly. Please come back and listen. The Fast Souls Trilogy, one of the most highly awarded fictional independent book series on the market, is a grand vision of human evolution. It chronicles the first spirit consciousness to enter the material world in three page-turning novels that introduce a new paradigm of reality based on genuine ancient wisdom and quantum science. These inspirational thrillers will force you to rethink the nature of the world in which we live. Visit the PeterCanova.com website for information and ordering. In a world facing annihilation, a miraculous African nun rises to become the first female pope through a web of war, murder, and betrayal. 
Loved by some, hated by many, she becomes the deadly target of Islamic terrorists and her own cardinals as she introduces a new vision that will either save humanity or accelerate its destruction. Four people must race against a nuclear holocaust to learn her astonishing secret. Pope Annalisa is available at PeterCanova.com, Amazon, and other online booksellers and bookstores worldwide. What if dreams can diagnose your life? What if we can meet the love of our life in dreams? Join host Cat O'Keefe Cannabis, the number one internationally best-selling author of Dreams That Can Save Your Life, written with Duke University medical doctor Larry Burke. Dreaming Healing is where we'll explore dreams, research, and interpret dreams from you, the caller. Dreaming Healing Shows can be heard every Tuesday at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern with live shows on the first and third evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific Time on syndicated Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. Come live your dreams out loud with Cat. How did life start on Earth and why is there so much suffering? Are we living in a simulated reality like the characters in the Matrix movie? Do parallel dimensions exist alongside ours, influencing our experience? What are the mysterious dark energies that penetrate our universe? Peter Canova folds space and time to bring the twin bookends of ancient wisdom and quantum science into a single focal point, answering these and many other deep mysteries of the creation. Quantum Spirituality can be heard every Tuesday at 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. Eastern and 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Pacific on syndicated Dream Vision 7 radio network. See the show where past and present merge to show us our future. This is Dream Vision 7 radio network, uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart, bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax, and enjoy. Let life flow. Hi, I'm Peter Canover, and we're back. We're on Dream Vision 7 Radio. This is Quantum Spirituality. And uh, we're talking today about quantum physics and the creation and consciousness and the latest theories of how quantum physics is coming around to understanding or looking at the fact that consciousness is the basis for all reality, everything we see. There is an uncon uh, there is a, let's say, invisible energy, conscious energy that really permeates everything and that we as human beings are part of that whole chain of projection right down here to our own material existence. Uh, now, uh, let's talk about the idea about consciousness um, permeating everything. Now, how does that really work? Well, they're also developing something called integrated information theory, which really understands um, consciousness as a vibration uh, that is transformed with it. consciousness is a vibration containing information. And the degree to which we process that information or transform that information to, into something usable is the degree to which we are conscious. So um, a couple of psychologists uh, here, Tam Hunt and Jonathan Schooler, uh, have said that consciousness can all come, come down to the way things vibrate. So what does that mean? Vibrate is a term a lot of us use, but let's get a little bit more uh, granular about what vibrate means. Um, the information that comes from consciousness is universal. It permeates everything. So it's like a radio station that's broadcasting 24 seven. However, unless we tune to the right channels, that information doesn't really come in or to the extent we tune and get the clear channel. Um, that's when uh, we experience the higher consciousness. So if you take the example again of a rock, um, a rock doesn't have something that they call recurrent processing. Now, recurrent processing is, think of it as like a loop, as like an information loop. The human brain is able to process and reprocess thoughts. In other words, it's able to, in a flash, uh, examine thoughts 
from a multitude of viewpoints that loop like energy through the brain. So in, in essence, it's almost like you have a bunch of people vetting one problem as opposed to a rock, which has no way to vet anything. It's just there. Uh, it exists. It has consciousness that is forming it, that, but, but it has no way to sort of process anything higher than that. Whereas the human brain with recurrent processing is able to really get this vibration, examine it, project it, do something with it, receive it. Um, it's, a, it's a much more complex process that goes on. So when we say that everything is conscious, everything is consciousness in matters of degree. Now, this really explains a lot of that paradox we talked about at the very beginning. So you remember that we have the visible world of solid matter and particles, but in the quantum world, we have light energy waves. Well, when you introduce consciousness as the basis for everything, the solution is that consciousness collapses waves into particles. And the double slit experiment that we talked about on the last show, where um, observers uh, certainly seem to affect the behavior of particles or even the appearance of particles in experiments, uh, is one of the experimental indications that we have that this is correct. In the visible world, we said that space was limited to one object. In the quantum world, that objects can exist in the same space. Well, consciousness, has no space. Uh, consciousness is all objects, all things everywhere. Time is linear in the visible world, but linear time is non-existent in the quantum world. Well, again, consciousness is all things at all times, which is the, you know, the bridge between um, what we, what is and what we see. Uh, consciousness, as you recall, through the brain is limited down so that the perception of time being linear is part of that limitation. But the real reality is that consciousness is everywhere. So there really is time. Time is non-existent. The speed of light limitation of the visible world and the no speed of light limitation of, con uh, of the quantum world is again explained by the fact that consciousness is everything all at once. So there really are no distances, there really is no space because everything in, in consciousness in the highest level of reality uh, is there all at once, it's simultaneous. So there is, no, there is no speed of light limitation. In fact, there probably isn't even a necessity for having a speed of light or travel. And finally, the issue of locality and non-locality. Um, that, if you remember, was the whole thing about um, uh, particles or things being able to experience each other in exactly simultaneous fashion, even though they are huge distances apart. Consciousness explains that by the fact that all things are part of the same whole. So uh, obviously, um, you know, if, uh, if these two things are encompassed within the circle of consciousness, um, in, in another way, they're really happening at the same time. And that's why they're able to experience similar experiences simultaneously. So you see that consciousness, understanding that consciousness is the basis for reality, explains the paradox between what we find in the quantum world and what we experience in the visible world. Now, to explain this in a slightly different way, we have the archetypal or energetic source world. Now we explained archetypes in the previous uh, show and archetypes are those aspects of the master consciousness that are individualized and they, they represent or they carry out uh, different, uh, different tasks. For instance, in the Gnostic tradition, the archetypes were given basic human impulses and basic human um, emotions, uh, love, uh, imagination, wisdom, uh, so forth and so on. How, how, we, how we achieve these ideals in our own human minds are from these energetic archetypes in the higher dimensions, uh, transmitting their energy through. So the source mind produces organized images in a continual creation. That arc, those archetypes are the first step of that, uh, that energy flowing downward. And that energy goes into the psychic or mind dimension of the soul so that the souls uh, essentially um, take these archetypal images 
and they manipulate them at the soul level for whatever the soul purpose is. And we perceive the archetypal images through our soul minds or through our subconscious. As Kat and I discussed in the, um, the previous segment of this show, uh, our soul minds, really our conscious soul minds become our subconscious human minds so that the language of our subconscious mind is in symbols. And the symbols that we perceive are these archetypal symbols that have been processed through our soul minds. And finally, uh, that comes down to uh, projections of images that externalize in our material world, that we perceive these images, our human brains take these ideas and take these images and essentially we translate those into the perception of the material world. Again, it's very holographic in nature. All life seems to be a holographic projection of conscious, intelligent information that's modulated and stepped down through different dimensions and gives us the variety and diversity that we experience, we finally experience at the lower levels uh, as the material world. So what it all boils down to is this. We are living in a projected universe and we're the projectors. And we're certainly part of that chain of projection that leads right down here to the material level, but it is part of a master consciousness that will permeate everything that we have and permeate everything that we are and create our reality. And, you know, it's a liberating thing when you come to think of it because this master consciousness is so powerful and that we're connected to it and that we can all do what the Gnostics did in terms of using and tracing our own consciousness to perceive our higher selves and gain better control over our lives, over our existence, and understand what the operation of this world is about. So I just want to leave off um, and tell you that uh, we've come to the end of our show. And I want to thank our producer, Bob, and I want you to join me the first Tuesday uh, of every month for Quantum Spirituality um, over Dream Vision 7 Radio. And uh, on the next shows or upcoming shows, we'll be talking more about now that you've got this grounding in consciousness and I want you to go back and I want you to review the, the first couple of shows so you can see this in its entirety. Now you've got these principles down. Talk a little bit more about how you can use these in your own life uh, to your benefit. I'm Peter Canova. Please visit my website, petercanova.com and join us again for Quantum Spirituality. Thank you. The Fast Souls Trilogy, one of the most highly awarded fictional independent book series on the market, is a grand vision of human evolution. It chronicles the first spirit consciousness to enter the material world in three page-turning novels that introduce a new paradigm of reality based on genuine ancient wisdom and quantum science. These inspirational thrillers will force you to rethink the nature of the world in which we live. Visit the PeterCanova.com website for information and ordering. In a world facing annihilation, a miraculous African nun rises to become the first female pope through a web of war, murder, and betrayal. Loved by some, hated by many, she becomes the deadly target of Islamic terrorists and her own cardinals as she introduces a new vision that will either save humanity or accelerate its destruction. Four people must race against a nuclear holocaust to learn her astonishing secret. Pope Annalisa is available at PeterCanova.com, Amazon, and other online booksellers and bookstores worldwide. What if dreams can diagnose your life? What if we can meet the love of our life in dreams? Join host Cat O'Keefe Cannabis, the number one internationally best-selling author of Dreams That Can Save Your Life, written with Duke University medical doctor Larry Burke. Dreaming Healing is where we'll explore dreams, research, and interpret dreams from you, the caller. 
Dreaming Healing Shows can be heard every Tuesday at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern with live shows on the first and third evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific Time on syndicated Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. Come live your dreams out loud with Cat. How did life start on Earth, and why is there so much suffering? Are we living in a simulated reality like the characters in the Matrix movie? Do parallel dimensions exist alongside ours, influencing our experience? What are the mysterious dark energies that penetrate our universe? Peter Canova folds space and time to bring the twin bookends of ancient wisdom and quantum science into a single focal point, answering these and many other deep mysteries of the creation. Quantum Spirituality can be heard every Tuesday at 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. Eastern and 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Pacific on syndicated Dream Vision 7 radio network. See the show where past and present merge to show us our future. This is Dream Vision 7 Radio Network, uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart, bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax, and enjoy. Let life flow. <laughs> 